Welcome from the IBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter study group. This is June 1st of 2021. This is our 80th class. We're going to be working on the techniques, process analysis, and process modeling. Uh, the goal, our mission here is to bridge the gap between industry leaders and business analysts by building partnerships with professionals, educators, and employers so that we may empower, instruct, and engage the BA community. Our community is a worldwide community. We have people that attend our study groups in person and then many, many more that watch our study group uh, recordings. So if this recording helps you, reach out to us, let us know, encourage us with that. We have a lot of ways that you can reach us. Uh, the recordings are available here at this link. Click has dropped those into the chat. This study group happens every Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And we also have a variety of other ways that you can reach us listed down below. Watermark Learning has been kind enough to allow us to use their practice study questions. And although we're not using them today, they have given us a discount code. The discount code is Tampa Space 21. If you use that discount code while purchasing any of their products, it's 20% off. They not only have business analysis products, but they also have a variety of other topics. And it's things like flashcards, practice study questions, uh, classes. So check them out. Our organization is a volunteer-led organization. Cliff Gray is our president. You see him here in the Millennium Falcon. Uh, Yulia is our vice president of finance. She's right here. Kaylin and Priscilla are board members at large. My name is Theo Soren. I'm the vice president of career and professional development. It's my job to help you learn what you need to learn. So reach out and tell me what you need. If you need something else, let me know. We are looking for additional board members. We have a brand new board member and we are looking for a few more. Now, board membership does not mean that you have to give us the next five years of your life. It could be three months of doing something that either you want to get better at or something that you're good at. Either way, it gives you the opportunity to be a member of our board. It also gives you the opportunity to be able to put that on your resume that you are a board member of this chapter that works internationally. In our study group, we are accredited with the IBA because we have our CBAPs on board. Uh, Bob Churchill, you see him right here. Uh, it, he has his CBAP certification along with quite a number of other certifications. He also has a website called uh, rpchurchill.com. And you can see not only the topics that he presents today, but he's got a lot of other very interesting topics that are not only business analysis, uh, mechanical engineering strategy, uh, just really good stuff for a business analyst to be aware of. So re reach out to him at his website or here's his email address, bob at rpchurchill.com. Yulia is also a CBAP certified person. Again, our vice president of finance, she's attending. She was a member of our study group and she took the test and is now giving back as a board member and participating in our study groups. So uh, other people that have participated in our study groups, we've got Bonnie, Frank, Renu, Tish. Uh, those are people that we know of. I forgot there's a brand new one that just sent me a letter that said we were an integral part of her success and she only watched our recordings. So that was really cool. However, attending our study group means that you get to participate in our conversations. You get to ask questions. You get to be a part of the organization's community. And those conversations are really something that brings a lot of value to our, our discussion. I mean, our, our teaching. Uh, sometimes when we go through test questions, the, or the question, I'm sorry, the conversation centers around which is the best test question answer and what makes it better. Uh, when we're talking right now, we're going through techniques. We're talking about how these techniques help us in our real life uh, efforts to be better business analysts. So please do attend if you can in person. If you can't attend in person, you feel free to watch our recordings, but do lean in and help us with our organization by participating in one way or another. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob. He's going to talk about process analysis and process modeling. Take it away, Bob. 
and I'll probably talk about some other things too, because although there are two separate uh, techniques in the Baba for that, um, uh, there is not that much to say. So I can't think of things to say. I will probably cover other techniques also. Um, Bob, can I show the spreadsheet just one second before yeah, you please. get in there? And how do I, is it, you click on share screen and you pick what you want to share, right? Yep. Yes. I apologize. I was supposed to introduce you, Cliff, but I was thinking I was going to do that at the end. Cliff is our fearless leader. <laughs> we couldn't survive without Cliff. I, I just wanted to show this because, uh, you know, like I said, we try and keep attendance every time uh, for every class. You can see the spreadsheet's really big. It goes back all the way to some of the lunch and learns and et cetera. But basically, I put this out with the recordings. So if you're ever curious about what we have for you, You'll be able to open it and look at it. You won't be able to edit it. You'll be able to look at it. If you see anything that's questionable, just let me know. We can always make changes. Um, but basically, this first tab is what we have listed. And if you go to the second tab, you'll see that I standardized all the names in there. So we go to like Bonnie. Right now, she has 22. Because uh, I, I know you reached out, Bonnie, that, so I'm just picking on you. Um, but this is how I can get a count of how many Bonnie is showing up in. And we can get more descriptive if need be to, to see which actual event. But there that gives go. you a nice rough count. And uh, when it counts starts from which day? It counts everything in this tab. So that goes all the way back to, boy, January 2019. Well, I know I've been to over 80. Oh, Bob, you've been into a lot. Yes. You don't need to wait. Check. Uh, actually, I think it shows 54, but like I said, not a big deal. We've probably got you missing on a few, Bob. Because you should be more up by me. Um, but just so that if you're curious, you can take a look. If you have any questions, like I said, just reach out to me or Thea and we'll correct them. Right. So credit for this study group is, a, is something that's beneficial whenever you're applying for a certification. But it's also important for some other opportunities that you may have. So go ahead and use this credit if you need to. Okay, Bob. All right. Um, so process analysis and process modeling are in theory two different um, uh, techniques within the bad bog, but um, like some of the other ones, they might as well be the same. So modeling is kind of different than analysis in that you're drawing things, you're possibly simulating them, and so on. Um, so I've done simulation for much of my career, and that gives me the background to talk about all the stuff I share with you. And uh, I'll go into that link if I need to fill more time. Um, the bat box says that the creation and maintenance of models um, is one thing, and um, that's what you do to improve or design a process. 
Um, you can't do analysis without having a model, whether it's a simulation or not. A model in general is only a representation of a process. And by the way, I always talk about um, doing all the phases in my framework and doing business analysis in terms of uh, improving or designing processes, but all the same things apply to products and environments as well. However, processes or um, systems through which things move, they affect change, the process thing, and, um, you know, stuff goes in, stuff goes out, that kind of thing. That's what process analysis and modeling is all about. So um, I can't think of reasons to have models without doing analysis. And as a matter of fact, we actually did this in uh, one of the places I worked. We built simulation for a ton of land border crossings um, in the United States and also on the Canadian and Mexican sides of our borders. And even a... Um, one on the southern border of Mexico with, I think, Guatemala. So I was physically in Guatemala for about 30 minutes, unofficially, of course, because the port director took me over there in his truck. Um, so the reason you would do this is you build the model just for documentation, uh, for communication, and for configuration management. So we built all those models just so in case anybody wanted to do an actual analysis of one of those ports, um, they will have a model ready to go and manipulate and change parameters in and change the configuration of. Um, so basically a model is the representation, the analysis is the um, work you do to figure out what's going on and uh, uh, how you can make it better, how it's going to respond to change, and so on. So models come in many forms. I have a um, way I think about it. Models uh, really contain all the same things, right? And uh, whether it's a continuous fluid model, uh, which uh, most BAs will never worry about that, it's more an engineering thing. But um, most of us process streams of documents and people and communications and messages and database items and so on. So uh, you have standard pieces of all those. And the items come into entries um, and uh, items that are processed by a system, I always call them entities, but they can be anything that moves through or within a system. Um, so you can imagine documents coming in and uh, waiting in a queue and then um, going to individual queues and being processed in some sort of workstation or process that can be automated. It can be um, 
relate, uh, a person can be sitting at a screen doing something on a computer or can be doing something physical or a combination of all that. And a group of things might be called a facility. And then uh, you can have them in different kinds of cues. Uh, if it's a uh, cue, it's usually a FIFO, but other kinds are LIFO and so on. FIFO is first in, first out. So that's the standard cue you see most often. Here in Florida, especially in Central Florida, we call those Disney cues. Um, but, you know, Brits are always talking about how great they are at waiting in line. Um, parking lots are a kind of non fipo queue, um, and they can come in and go out at any order. Also, um, a parking lot, like, you can... Uh, hold different items in a place and that can cause other things to go on in head life um lives of their own go through a different sub processes and so on so there are um splits and merges and conditionals and business rules that govern all this. Um, we've spoken about those in previous weeks fairly recently. And uh, there are rules for where things go, um, routing percentages or conditional routings and so on. And uh, then uh, items go out of the model or the system under analysis. So just be aware that these processes can do anything you can think of, but they're standard components. So um, modeling is the process of creating or updating the conceptual model, which is the representation of the system, um, of building an as is state, a to be state of a processing system is also a model. Um, so I have all the phases of my uh, framework where you, uh, I've talked about this quite often. Um, you figure out what you need to do overall, figure out what's going on now, if there is something, figure out what you need that's requirements, both functional and non-functional. Then you have design, which is your proposed way or several proposed ways of solving the actual problem. Then you evaluate those, compare them and uh, pick one. Then you implement that and you do test. So we um, iterate within each phase to make sure everything is uh, understood correctly and agreed to by all the relevant parties. And you can iterate between phases as well to go back and correct or add things you missed um, or simply um, to you know, work together. So um, conceptual modeling includes discovery and data collection, and those really can be embedded in almost anything. You may do those to find out what's going on now, um, to research elements of a design while you're preparing it, whether or not there is an existing system, 
Also, um, implementation methods can change. So even if you know what you want to do, there may be a lot of different ways you're doing it. So you can do conceptual modeling there. And the same applies for testing. So this is kind of a floating phase that can happen anywhere or everywhere. Just be aware of that. Uh, the system analysis is usually done mostly during the requirements and design. So a little while ago, we talked about acceptability in the evaluation criteria that was within the last two or three weeks. And uh, we really talked about those uh, mostly in requirements and design. And then uh, we do evaluation criteria comparing different designs and also whether things are acceptable in uh, mostly testing. So uh, the number of ways you can do all these things are almost infinite. Um, six sigma is about reducing uh, variation in all the different phases of a process and not these phases, but all the different steps of a process like I uh, illustrated above. I think I've shown you um, uh, a lot of different types of systems. In the past, there are as many types of drawings and processes as you can think of. So um, I would invite you to uh, always take a look at the relevant sections of the Babbock. They have to be section 1034 and 35 for analysis and modeling. And uh, they're always uh, very similar. Let me talk about some of the applications for simulation, um, just so you know. Um, all these apply to um, business analysis too. So design and sizing, you want to know how much processing power you need to handle the load um, of what you're trying to process. For example, if you're processing messages or um, uh, documents or credit card receipts or uh, purchases or whatever, you have to figure out um, if you how fast they have to be if you handle them one at a time or if uh, doing them one at a time meaning serially will not be fast enough how many parallel stations you have to have so the processing speed times the number of stations will um equal or surpass the flow rate. That's what that's all about. The sizing is very closely related to that. Operations research is the um, process of figuring out a whole whole system works, how it consumes supplies, how it makes use of resources, how it uses tools and people and other things. So that's a study by itself. Uh, Real-time control is the process of uh, making adjustments to a process on the fly as things happen. So uh, for example, if you have, and there are infinite, number of these. If you have a grocery store 
in the uh, lines at the checkouts get longer, you'll go ahead and open more checkout lines in theory to process more customers. And then when the lines get shorter and the customers go away, you can close them down to have people do something else. So those kind of situations come up in business all the time. Uh, training, you might do models for training. Uh, having a representation of a system makes it clear to everybody what's going on. So there's uh, operator training and there's participatory training. Um, you can run a system kind of uh, as a single operator or as a team. There are a lot of different ways that can be done. It takes, for example, uh, one person to be generally an air defense gunner, but a team of people to run a nuclear power plant. Um, Risk analysis can be something you do. Um, economic analysis also, you can figure out the fixed and capital and variable and ongoing costs and add all that up uh, based on understanding of what's going on based on your model. Um, you can do an impact analysis to uh, figure out how things will change and who and or what might be affected. You can do process improvement. Um, you can do entertainment. Uh, that is germane largely to a simulation, less about um, business analysis and. Uh, you can also support sales. So does anyone have questions about process um, analysis or modeling? Don't know, jump in once. <laughs> Let me add a few things there. Uh, process analysis and process modeling is critical as a business analyst. Process modeling is one of the ways that you turn a very complex situation into pictures, and people understand pictures a whole lot faster than they understand complex words, you know, a paragraph. People aren't going to read a paragraph. If you send them an email with a paragraph, they're probably not going to read it. However, if you put a process model in swim lanes on a wall and you say, this is what I have for you. Do you agree? They will bring somebody else to it later and say, this is what I do. This is where you fit in. And they will they will use it as a tool. So I really believe in process modeling. It's one of my very favorite ways, especially with swim lanes, to show handoffs between different groups, different departments or applications, to show what the uh, responsibilities are for each of those. Then you can add things like, what is the frequency? How many? How long does this this phrase uh, these five steps take? Um, how many can you process in an hour, or how many can you process in a month? Or you know, get all of that information in one place, and it's really easy to make uh, decisions, business decisions. It's also really easy to show where you have pain points. Whenever you're creating a process model, let people know what you're doing. Do it in front of them and let them have a chance to review it. But also say, if you could change anything in your process, what would you change and why? And identify your pain points at that point so that people can, can uh, have that emotional engagement of, I contributed to this. This has my beliefs and thoughts in it. Um, like I said, um, uh, like Thea said, a picture is worth a thousand words. And like I was saying, an animation is worth or is a thousand pictures. Bob, what do you create your animation in? 
don't know. This is a custom written Java script. I've written in simulations in at least five different languages, probably six. So, you are just um, brilliant, dude. You have to be insane to write simulations in JavaScript on also Pascal, Fortran, C, C, SLX, and um, uh, I can't even remember the name of the other one. So the simulation you have displayed at the top, do you have a way to trigger just one thing and, and show what the results are? Well, the results are notional. They're reported down here for wait times and overall averages um, for uh, every time period and for um, the overall run of the simulation. So these again um, can generate massive amounts of numbers. Uh, we have uh, output files from simulations that are so big they cannot be handled by Excel, which handles uh, files up to two gigabytes. So um, these things can spit out as much data as you want. Okay, very and, nice. Uh, that is an example of a discrete event simulation. That is the kind uh, BAs would be more likely to do continuous systems or simulations or of uh, fluid and stress and heat transfer and things like that um, that tend to be more the realm of an engineer. Okay. Very nice. Does anyone have yeah, any? I, Go ahead. I run into that limitation with Excel all the time. Because, um, yeah, you get about 1.2 something million rows in Excel. So if you're dealing with a data set that has more than that, it will cut it off and won't allow you to work on it. So you have yeah. to use other tools. We have to do in those cases is write some kind of parsing tool that'll summarize it and characterize it and process it item by item, record by record. And they can't mm -hmm. do it automatically anymore. Okay, very good. This is the kind of stuff that AI is going to come in really handy with in the future. Assuming AI has enough memory, it is resource limited just like everything else. It is just a computer. By the way, a cloud is just somebody else's computer. <laughs> True. You don't know how many times I have that conversation. Yep. Uh, the cloud is just somebody else's network. It, yep. That's all it is. Um, yeah. If you would have told me 20 years ago, the amount of money we spend and make moving people to the cloud, I would have told you were you were crazy. But, but it's companies true. willingly. Oh, yeah. No, they offset everything. I mean, 20 years ago, you would have <laughs> never thought about taking all your most important information in storing it on somebody else's system. The government does it, <laughs> which is goofy. It is. <laughs> DOT okay. has, uh, sends all their stuff to Amazon in DC. What could go wrong? No, no, nothing at all. Nothing at all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do we have any questions or comments about using this technique or these techniques? Uh, let me make two other comments. Um, one is that a process can be dependent and or represented in any way that makes sense. Um, I know Thea loves doing swim leans, but they're essentially a flow joint. 
I tend to use a different um, representation that shows people at various stations to show the um, uh, interactions that go on. But um, it's all the same thing. Industries may have standards. Um, there are standard kind of business process notations like uh, BPMN. I have a book about that here someplace. Here we go. So this thing is... Uh, BPMN is a standard business process modeling notation. I think it stands for. And um, that's a good thing to know, but um, there are all kinds of standards for different industries. Um, so use them when they're specified, but beyond that, Anything that communicates what's going on to your customers, SMEs, um, um, team members, and so on, uh, will work. Right. So whenever you create any kind of, of document like this, be sure you're doing it in a program that other people can access. If you're putting it in Visio, be sure that other people have a Visio that will be looking at it or a Lucid chart, whatever it is. And you could just use the basic data set, the basic symbols that are in each of those to create the document that you need. Make, don't make it any more complicated than you have to. Stun them with simplicity and, and go with that way. I do a huge amount of uh, images and diagrams using nothing more than rectangles and arrows and text. So um, everything is a combination of that. Uh, what's going on is more important than how you're representing it. That's it. Um, People will take it wrong. We did a 3D model of a port up in uh, somewhere in the Great Lakes, either east or west of Buffalo. And uh, the team just put some houses at random around the um, outside of the port just to make it look scenic. And there was one woman there, just a random member of the public they were demoing to. And she said, I live in that house. It's the wrong color. <laughs> and, you know, people will uh, make mistakes and misinterpret everything. That's true. So, <clears throat> Next subject, we've beaten that one to death. Um, let's okay. talk about uh, interface analysis. Okay. So interfaces are um, basically any time two uh, people talk to each other or two things. It could be a person and a machine to people, a person in an item, a document, something physical, um, do machines talk into each other, electronic, those are all examples of interfaces. Um, even you can have mechanical languages like the way of fit, stages of a rocket fit together or um, just anything that um, uh, communicates or uh, whether it's physically or informationally, that's what interfaces are all about. So um, interfaces are used to connect uh, processes within a single machine. And they can do that a lot of ways. It's more an issue for programmers and so on than it is for BAs, but you ought to know, um, I've talked about 
uh, software in the past. I've given a couple of webinars on the subject. I've talked about it for a full hour one week here, um, you know, nine months ago or so. So they're out there. Um, and you ought to know what your programmers, if you are not one, are thinking. And the, um, the items within a computer can talk to each other via shared memory, procedure calls, messages, and other kinds of things. Processes on separate machines will talk to each other electronically, either um, via some kind of radio or some kind of wire. Um, it could be serial fiber optic parallel. Um, it can be all kinds of different protocols. So there's a physical um, way things talk to each other, and there's an informational way. Uh, much of what goes on now is IP packets. So you send chunks of information which have routing um, information which help a packet get where it's going. And uh, then there's a payload, which is the actual information you want to communicate. Uh, you can do this so quickly, for example, that you can send a whole bunch of packets quickly enough to reproduce voice uh, clearly enough to have phone calls and do things like Zoom, which is actually pretty cool if you think about what's going on. Um, so if you have two machines talking to each other, that's one thing. But now imagine machines on totally different networks. So your machine has to talk to a router, which will talk to maybe a whole bunch of intermediate machines all over the planet, potentially, or even in space. And that'll go to another network and communicate with some other machine at which another person may be sitting. So all those things can happen. Um, there are tons of user interfaces. So a standard software GUI is one. Um, there are uh, physical interfaces, so you're familiar with the term ergonomics, which is like how hand tools and things fit your hand. Think scissors or hammers or screwdrivers or whatever, even pens and pencils. But um, uh, video games with different controls, if you're used to that, they can be all different. Um, nuclear power plants, cars, uh, construction equipment, uh, milling machines, anything you can think of, all have interfaces. Um, so, like I said, over the wire things, there's a uh, a kind of electrical protocol, a way um, signals are sent physically, and then there's an informational way to do handshaking and so on. Uh, one thing that's happened over time as software has gotten more abstract, uh, we want to uh, um, write software so it'll run on any machine. And that means we have to simplify things. It makes things easier on the one hand because we just say, here, here's a block of text and uh, we know how to encode it and then read it and peel it apart to understand the information that was once been in. Um, so uh, it takes a lot of extra 
work in memory to do that, but that's better than uh, having to hand code thing that only work uh, in one context. So HTML and XML are um, standard communication protocols that um, are kind of verbose and text-based. Um, there are standard formats, uh, file format for videos and audios and images and things like that. Um, interfaces need to uh, make sure uh, they maintain integrity. So when one thing is transmitting, it has to uh, have a way to keep the other side from interfering. So they work out handshaking ways to do that. For example, if one process is writing to a file um, and multiple processes have access to it, what they'll do is they'll set a flag someplace that says, hey, I'm writing to this, this file is in use, don't mess with it. Go ahead and do something else for a while and come back. And it'll periodically test that flag. And when the flag is unset, then a second process can access the file and uh, do its thing. So there's a whole article I wrote about mutexes. And mutexes are actually mutual exclusion. There are a ton of ways to do this. Um, communications have to be checked for errors. So uh, when you send a packet, you might do a check on it to uh, make sure the information is the way um, you think it is. For example, uh, when you used to send things over a serial connection, you would all um, do a cyclic redundancy check. So it's a way of generating a number that is kind of an aggregate summary of uh, all the data that's in the packet in the payload. So you'll send uh, the payload and the CRC check and uh, the receiving computer will uh, read the packet, do its own CRC um, check of the received data, um, check it against the transmitted CRC value and uh, if they those numbers match, you have a very high probability that you transmitted the data correctly. Um, You're bringing back bad memories, Bob. Oh, I You're know. talking to check some stuff that we so used to there's do. There's <laughs> all these things these geeks are doing behind the scenes that you vaguely be, um, need to be aware of. So, if you're a really good BA, when you're talking to your implementers, you ask them uh, if they're doing stuff like this, ask them what uh, overhead is needed and so on, because that'll take time and resources in systems you build in or maintain or modify. Um, Interfaces should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. I always say that in a lot of things. Um, I talk about different methods of communication that I've used. So um, interfaces can be um, UIs are done, UI, UX, there are serial communications, those are kind of old now, 
um, there are different protocols, informational protocols that go over serial and parallel. This particular one I described is about um, controlling a low-level HVAC equipment in building. Um, there's parallel, which used to be how um, printers would talk to computers. Now it's all USB, which is another form of fancy serial port. Most internet messages are passed by TCP IP. I talked about that a little while ago. Um, there are a bunch of different uh, ways that happen. Um, there is a special communication protocol called text message queues um, that are used on fax in uh, alpha machines made by DEC, which is Digital Equipment Corporation, and that handled all the queuing and retrying uh, when you're communicating. That was nice because uh, they bundled up a lot of stuff, so we uh, programmers didn't have to worry about it. Um, there's a thing called high-level architecture, and uh, that allows a lot of real-time systems to talk to each other where they use this, a big place they use this is in uh, multiplayer or multi-participant trainers and uh, dungeons. So military simulations, you might have people all over the country in a uh, weapon system simulators in a shared environment, and they're all doing their thing and having battles and whatever, and all the handshaking done is uh, HLA. And there's also a newer version called DIS, which is Distributed Information System, I think. Um, you can share things in memory, so, uh, Many processes on one machine can talk to each other. Um, you've got file exchanges. You've got web APIs and microservices. So when you um, actually talk to uh, a website, what you're doing is downloading a file. And it gives you HTML and JavaScript and some other stuff. And uh, that allows you to interact with a thing on your computer that then it can exchange messages with the server. So it does something you want and reports back. So that's what's going on. There's a whole communication protocol going on there. Um, database polling, so you can query databases to do communication as much as you can use it to store and manipulate data. Screen scraping is an interesting process. So. There are older mainframe systems that people do not want to rewrite. Um, there aren't that many people who know how to do it anymore. The systems work, they're expensive to change and replace. So what you do is have a terminal program that knows how to, in an automated way, controlled by your software. Um, make uh, enter commands, bring up the right records, read them off the display screen by um, uh, location, uh, by realm and column, scrape that off and then store it and use it in a modern system. It's a little crumb magnet, but it works. 
Um, I think you're maybe seeing less of it over time, but um, when you have robotic process automation, it's fundamentally doing something similar. It's a way to go out and control somebody else's UI or website and do the same thing. And I'm sure you've heard of RPA. Um, there are some really old protocols that nobody talks about anymore. And those are just the ones I worked on. I'm sure there are tons of more. Um, so anyone have any questions about those? That I'm sure we more than you wanted to know about that someday. <laughs> Possibly. Let me take the screen real quick and, and do a few things to close up. Okay, we do have a list of techniques that have not yet been claimed. If you're interested in presenting techniques, let us know. Uh, just, just email me through LinkedIn. Uh, all we need is for you to tell us what Babox said. That's what the minimum requirement. What does Babox say about that technique so that we can help other people know? If you would also like to add your own experience of using that technique, that's even better. Uh, I want to turn you all on to this gentleman. His name is Aaron Wittenberger. He has been a business analyst active in business analysis for over 20 years. If you follow him, he puts out something at least once a week of new uh webinars for business analysts. Here's training opportunities for business analysts. Here's all kinds of stuff. He is prolific at putting out new opportunities for business analysts to learn. So that's a cool thing. Uh, let's see. And if any of you do not have access to a, um, to a Babok, they are online. We also have a link to them in our shared folder. So you have access to Babox if you don't have one in your possession. So having one in your possession is really great for studying, but if you don't have that, you can get access to them. Uh, this, is, this is just exactly the material that you would have to learn to be able to take the, any of the certification tests. There are different levels of certification for business analysis and the IIBA, the International Institute of Business Analysis, uh, also have a couple of other different certifications. So we also have, well, there's just a whole list. So I'm going to let you go look at those. But this is the book for business analysis certification tests. Uh, is there anything else to add? Oh, oh, let's talk about what we're doing next week. That's something that would be really good. Uh, let's see. I've got Yulia talking about data mining. Uh, Yulia, how much time do you think you're going to want for to talk about data mining? You want the whole hour, half an hour? <laughs> Full hour. I mean, it's a huge topic. I don't know, 20 minutes. I already did presentation slides, but I didn't practice yet. Okay. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah. 15, 20 minutes. Okay, we will add another topic to that. If anyone else would like to help us out with some of these. Collaborative games, that's an easy one. Even if you don't have experience in business analysis, you can talk about collaborative games. Um, brainstorming, that's something that even if you don't have experience in business analysis, you probably have done brainstorming before. Just tell us what's in the Babok. Don't leave everything up to Bob to have to cover. Um, it's also a great thing to be able to put on your resume. I presented at the at the IIBA Tampa Bay you know, study group. So, you know, take advantage of that. We are here for you to succeed. We will support you 100%. You can't do it badly. Just do it. And we would love that. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can see my name at the bottom of the screen probably or at, or at my picture. My name is not spelled easily, but if you find me, you will never lose me. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are at time. Uh, we will see you next week. We will be talking about data mining and at least one more topic, uh, techniques as we go through the techniques in the Babak 
the IIBA's handbook. I will see y'all next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.